You're listening to the Veteran Etc. Podcast, as there's always more to be said about a veteran. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran, ex-monk, season war trauma therapist, and writer, as he shares his years of research in veteran readjustment culture and the meaning of warrior life. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Veteran, etc. This episode will deal with American volunteers in the Ukraine. This is an audio essay that goes back to the beginning of the Russian invasion into the Ukraine and several thoughts I've had since the beginning of the war. Americans from the beginning of the war were prone to President Zelensky's call to arms. Zelensky asked volunteers from all over the world and focusing a lot of his attention on American volunteers, specifically American veterans, to go and join the Ukrainian forces against Russia, to join the the legion. There is a Ukrainian legion based based on foreign nationals, many from the United States, There are some 20,000 volunteer workers out in the Ukraine right now from from all over. And that includes humanitarian as well as military. I would say there's probably more. The numbers say 20,000, but I would say more. Whether you go to fight or not, whether you go to train or not, the question I present is, what meaning does that provide you? What meaning does that provide us as Americans, as veterans, as we see our brothers and sisters go off into another war that seems to resemble the wars in the United States, these forever wars? Ukraine, to me, resembles a forever war. It's closer to the Korean conflict the Korean War, the war that devastated my family back in the 50s, because it's superpowers fighting for a certain level of control and giving the object of war, the country actually offering most of the the fighting as well as the casualties. That country, in this instance, Ukraine, during my father's time, the Korean War, Korea. These are proxy wars. And my question is, when President Biden is committing $54 billion to the Ukrainian military to continue fighting this war with Russia, I question this outside of politics because I'm not a Democrat or a Republican when it comes to this matter. I'm for the American Veteran Party, and that is strictly apolitical and focus on the reintegration, readjustment of veterans in the United States. This isn't a real party. I'm just using certain level of hyperbolic language here. But you can see that I am concerned with the veteran plight and not necessarily veterans getting involved in other wars, whether it's to go to Syria and fight ISIS, or in this case, to fight the Russian aggression in the Ukraine. All of this being said, let me just say, Russia did violate uh, international law by invading the Ukraine. At the same time, there were other minor violations of war committed by the Ukrainians and the United States in many ways by setting up large defense barriers uh, in the Ukraine. This escalation of militarism is, in my opinion, a minor violation of international law because the Ukraine should be, at this point, focusing on economic development through the EU, not through NATO. 
and also focusing on being an area there that does not provide any type of threat to Russia. In the United States, it's very difficult for us to understand that because we spent many years thinking of movies like Hunt for Red October, Red Dawn, No Way Out, and other movies. I even remember a movie as a kid where there was some spy comedy movie on on TV. But the thing is, Russia has always been an object all throughout my life as far as the object for attack, the threat against us. My question is, do we really know how much of a threat they are? And if we were ever to truly become enemies and and truly fight against each other, because in reality, we fought together in World War II, some of the truly important battles of World War II were won by the Russians. This we cannot deny. We cannot deny that if it were not for Russian forces, Soviet forces, we would not have success in World War II. Historians, if you look at Dr. Glantz, he's David Glantz, I believe. He writes a lot on on this. He writes a lot on the Soviet participation in World War II and the U.S. view of the Soviets. And so we need to kind of like look at historians like him, like Glantz, before we make the decision to be in a war with Russia, before we send out our young to go fight, before we send out veterans who fought already in Afghanistan and Iraq to go fight in the Ukrainian front. My question is, we have $54 billion set up for the Ukrainians. And my question is, why do we have $2.7 billion for the homeless veterans out there for the budget? I'm questioning all of this. Who takes the priority, the soldiers in the Ukraine or veterans who have already served their country here and need help? This is my big thing. The other big thing that I have is that troops here, veterans here in the United States need to focus on their readjustment. They need not be re-triggered by fighting a war overseas and then coming back, having to pick up the pieces again and go through readjustment again. This sets up more challenges for clinical staff at the VA, for nonprofits working with veterans, and for others trying to advocate for the care of war trauma. Where do we go from here? What do we do? Well, one thing is to look at what has led to some of this information that has come out besides Zelensky's call to action where we have veterans from the United States going over to the Ukraine. Prior to that, we had a book around 2016 called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, you know, the author of The Perfect Storm and other books. In the book Tribe, Sebastian Younger says that that veterans and civilians are at a divide because Veterans seem to be tied to this concept of tribe and tribe, according to Sebastian Younger, is something that troops share in common that resources as well as the willingness for troops to risk their lives together and give their lives for each other, that these are the big characteristics of tribe. I want to actually look into this deeper and not look at the volunteers into the Ukraine and to these other wars. Sebastian Younger was writing at a time during the situation in Syria and Iraq with ISIS and how a lot of veterans were triggered by ISIS and veterans were questioning then, well, what What is happening? What did we do over there? Did it all make a difference? 
this goes back to issues of Vietnam and Vietnam veterans asking, why did we leave? And if we look at certain movies like Rambo and we remember Rambo in the second movie, Rambo, Colonel Troutman asks Rambo to go out on a rescue mission of vet of American Vietnam troops who are in a POW camp. And so this is a rescue mission. And Rambo asks Colonel Troutman, his old special forces commander, sir, do we have a chance to win this time? In our minds, whether you served in Iraq or not, or in Afghanistan or not, the question looms, do we have a chance to win? And how can we rectify that? Are we always chasing that? That seems to be more these type of issues and questions more tied to group dynamic versus tribal dynamic. And here we find Wilford Bion, B-I-O-N, the late great psychoanalyst, clinician, innovator of group therapy and group transformation groups, World War I hero from the British Army, a tanker who was known for going through some pretty hellacious missions, and then becoming a medical doctor, psychiatrist, and the the leading clinician at the Northfield Medical Hospital for military personnel in England during World War II. And this is where we find Bion setting up much of his theories on group work. And it's interesting. Beyond looks at groups from three perspectives. And I think this is connected towards what's happening in the Ukraine now versus looking at this issue of tribe. Beyond sees groups as far as one, either being caught up in dependency or two, having a fight or flight dynamic or three, having a group set up where there's a level of regeneration happening and the hope for the future is set in that group. I'll go over these three different types of models for groups that Bion discussed. And maybe you can kind of see how maybe these veterans who have come back from the Ukraine provide narratives to the news that are very different to the narratives provided by the actual news networks. I've already made contact with one of the first to go to the Ukraine and return after being exposed to heavy rocket attacks by the Russian military. This veteran served in Iraq and Afghanistan. His name is Hugh Lee, L-E. And when he came back, he was criticized by certain members of the veteran community for returning and for having his open views. In all of this, I will say this is more an issue of group dynamics versus tribe dynamics. Why do I say that? Let's review those three different types of groups that Beyond talks about. The first group is dependency. Beyond says that in a group, the group is looking for a hero. And in that search for a hero, group memberships will follow and set up a lead, a leader. That leader will provide information towards, towards the group. And after a while, there can be some awakening and the leader is removed and a new leader is set up. That's one type of group. And usually it's because members are trying to find some type of identification, but they're finding their identification through this dependency. And so that's one way to look at what's happening over in the Ukraine, right? Because you've got Zelensky, the leader calling on organization of a legion, right? This legion of veterans that is supposed to go fight into an area that they're not really aware of. And and from that one leader, there have been veterans who have 
set up different groups and that have been featured in the media to set up different groups. And these groups have been led by these particular charismatic figures. And I'm not questioning their motives, but in many ways, not that these group leaders are dismissed, but you know, there could be, as in the case of Lee and a couple of other people who have gone out there to the Ukraine and have come back and have basically said, it's not worth losing your life over there, that the conditions are much more horrible than what's being described by the U.S. military or the the, the military, the media military. At first, there wasn't much being said you know, by the press or by the U.S. military for people to go out and volunteer to help the Ukrainian government. This is completely problematic because you've got veterans here who need care and do not need to be under any type of military system right now other than receiving care from the readjustment from the military. And so the dependency group, what type of what type of care are they actually receiving out in a battlefield, re-triggering their their war wounds? That's a question I have. The other type of group that Beyond talks about is the fight or flight group. And this is probably the type of group that resonates. What I would say most of the volunteers going to the Ukraine. These volunteers are caught up with a do or die type of attitude that is going beyond an issue of a certain type of message by a certain leader or group of leaders. But it's in many ways to encourage this sense of mission and calling, right, against a certain enemy. And this is more tied to the volunteers headed out to Ukraine, this fight or flight type of group. And if we see the groups in this way versus these large tribes of volunteers, we may get a better understanding in regards to the minds of those volunteering to join the Georgian Legion or the Ukrainian Legion without understanding that if caught by the Russians, the Russians have already said that they would treat volunteers, not as combatants, but as criminals. And the heavy price of being treated as a criminal in the Russian justice system is something heavy that I think a lot of veterans overlook who end up volunteering. Going into the last group, and this is something that I would say is for group work, interesting. And I wonder if in some of my groups that I facilitated combat trauma groups, if it's this message that I was trying to promote, and that is an issue of hope as far as being a part of a group as a hopeful type of experience to improve one's life. And these are pairing groups. And I think at times they can be a bit idyllic. At times they can be focused on unity in such a way that may give off the promise and vision of a new future. And that was something that I was always trying to help folks to connect with as far as looking at the future for a better life after their military experience. We've got to pay attention to this because I don't say that one group is right or wrong. And I'm not even saying that that tribalism is right or wrong. I would just say that I wonder how much anthropological work Sebastian Younger has done on war and tribes because it wasn't always that the warrior was commanded to go to war or was prone for war. As a matter of fact, more, most are, many archaeologists and anthropologists have said that war is something somewhat recent in as far as human history. It goes back to... 10,000 BC. It's what, like 10,000, you know, there was no war as as we understand it to be. Uh, It's only like 10,000 years old, really, in regards to human history. And so maybe 
there was a mix of all of these different types of group dynamics happening with people and how they, human beings, how they negotiated versus. And, and really, was it an issue of fighting off the environment, such as uh, wildlife and, and, and the environment versus one another? It seems to me that at an earlier time in human history, without warfare, people came together, human beings came together, and even in tribes, and work out their understandings without major use of warfare. And that's why I don't believe that there's this civilian veteran divide as all of these writers from the Iraq war, they've come out to the newspapers like Phil Clay and Roy Cranton and Scranton and all these others who continuously talk about this veteran civilian divide, including Mar Marble Collegiate Church when they had their veteran civilian dialogues. And I was even a part of that. And I and I questioned, well, how how much of a true difference is there? I mean, is it mostly a sense of misunderstanding that needs to be sorted out versus a divide between veterans and civilians? I kind of go with looking at seeing the veteran as someone vulnerable. When the veteran is back home, the veteran is vulnerable. And it's society's lack of knowledge, or I would say the preoccupation with the present accelerated lifestyles that we have, whether you're a civilian or a veteran, that just keeps one not connected to the veteran readjustment reality. And even the veteran is guilty of that because how many veterans, like after they serve their own war, truly, truly go and make great efforts to help veterans of other wars? It's usually the veteran stuck in his or her own readjustment, trying to find his or her own meaning to figure out their readjustment versus going to the latest group of veterans and trying to cure their readjustment issues. This was what brought me a certain level of anger when I came back from Iraq with my veteran community. And I've learned to let go of some of that because I say to myself, you know, they were caught up in their readjustment. I remember a very close friend of mine once who was, I felt ignoring my telephone calls when I returned from Iraq. And I was speaking to my sister, who was also a combat veteran. And on the phone, I had said, well, this person is really letting, I feel that they've kind of let me down because they don't really answer my calls. My sister turned to me and she said, don't you realize this person's also going through their own readjustment? That made me have greater empathy. And it made me look at everyone and say in the veteran community that each veteran has their own readjustment. And the key is to understand the context of military service for every vet. When we do this, I think we have a better understanding, especially with the situation with the Ukraine. We learn why is this person headed there? Why is this person going there? Why is this person going to go train Ukrainian troops, even though they may not be fighting? Why is this person offering humanitarian aid? What type of mission do they think they're going to be accomplishing? In all of this, we get a better understanding of the Ukrainian involvement of veterans. And now we are faced with two veterans who have been captured and who have mentioned a sense of regret. Now, we don't know if they were pressured to make those comments by the Russian authorities, but we have two veterans, one from the Marine Corps, one from the Army, who have been captured and are in the Ukraine. And they're in a very difficult position in being captured. Imagine, how would you be if you were captured? How would you be if your occupiers or those who've captured you are not treating you as a soldier, as a captive under the Geneva Convention. Does that raise matters to a more serious light? It should. We should be looking at the meaning-making veterans have 
when you hear of a veteran who wants to join and volunteer and head off to the Ukraine. We need to understand what are they saying about their home life right now? What are the things that are said about their families, about how they are functioning at work? How are they doing in school? Is the Ukrainian volunteer movement a thing to substitute facing the struggles and challenges of military readjustment at home? Is this a way to find a new understanding or new meaning of heroism because there is very little that's offered here back home because of this veteran civilian misunderstanding, not divide? Notice I say misunderstanding, not divide. As we continue to look at the war in the Ukraine, and as the media is starting to point out the realities of the battles happening in the Ukraine, that it's not some type of insurgency happening involving small arms fire, but actually a true, true modern warfare in the largest sense in regards to heavy machinery, including art artillery. A Russian military that outnumbers the Ukrainian military eight to one in regards to artillery pieces. This is important to notice because when you are being killed by or injured by indirect fire, what does that do to you? Where are you going to go if you survive that and you come back home to the United States? That's my question to you. You may see me as a negative person, but I'm mostly concerned with the readjustment, reintegration of troops who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're putting their lives out on the line in the Ukraine for this meaning of humanitarian aid and care to this war that is not directly affecting the survival of the United States. In many ways, is volunteering a way of expressing some level of self, some type of self-projection, as Freud would say in Civilization and its miscontents, that basically the anger and the violence that's, that's projected on others is usually something coming from the self, coming from inside, some type of internal bothering that's happening inside, and it's brought out, and it's a desire to, to come out in, in aggression. And so, is this pursuit to be in a war zone in, in the Ukraine something that's from within because of the pains of readjustment at home after Iraq and Afghanistan and now displaced into this new war zone in the Ukraine? Do we have this type of understanding, this potential for looking closer into the, the volunteers that are headed to the Ukraine? Do we understand and do those who are going to the Ukraine as volunteers understand that the Ukrainian military is a national military and that you are basically an outsider in that military and that by and large, the best resources, the best opportunities to function on missions are not going to be given to you? Can, can we face that reality? As we see this war progress, can we also recognize that not everyone that you served with, and this is what Sebastian Younger kind of alludes to, and other veterans and, you know, Sebastian Younger is not a veteran, but those veteran allies out there, they talk about this band of brothers dynamic, which exists, but there's also within our ranks, those who were not seen as brothers or sisters, but those who we actually feared, probably feared more than the actual enemy. We've seen this in, in movies, ironically enough, in the movie Platoon, when you have the two NCOs fighting over Charlie Sheehan. One, the hardcore Sergeant Barnes, played by Berenger. And... Then you have the medic who's played by Willem Dafoe, who's also a seasoned veteran in combat who shows a sense of humanity in the war zone. 
we see the triangulation of these three different figures in combat in the movie Platoon. We also see uh, Sean Penn in the movie Casualties of War, where he saves Michael J. Fox in the movie, but at the same time is guilty of of war crimes in the movie. And Michael J. Fox has to make the decision of reporting the war crime or not. Right. This is a very confusing situation, right? Where it's not so fixed, not so easy to kind of place the warrior in regards to understanding the warrior in simplistic tribal ways and customs, but more probably resembling Beyond's understanding of groups in regards to those groups that are focused on a particular leader or a certain type of ideology or a fight or flight basically tied to survival, the group of survival, or the pairing group, the the group that I would say is based on a certain level of promise for a hope. In this particular case, I would say my ideal group would be the group that I'm always looking at is that parent group, that there's a hope for the future, that we can have better lives as veterans in our society. And these are not perfect groups, but again, having a vision versus not having a vision for me is something imperative because it's something that I want for myself as a veteran, something I want for my sister as a veteran and other veterans who are not tied to my specific tribe or my specific group. I also want this for civilians as well and civilian allies. And so how I end this essay is focus on hope. Are the activities that we're a part of, the things that we volunteer, do they add hope, a real hope, a tangible hope in the things that we actually do? Or are they tied to some type of narrative of myth that helps us fantasize about hope. Veteran Etc. invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim, every Sunday. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, please share the podcast with others. Give a like and or post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veteran Etc., check out ComingHomeWell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thank you for tuning in.